Mr. Ian Blees, Director of Rugby and Operations at Salford. What a pleasure to have you on uh, Out of Your League. And for people watching on YouTube, you're joining us via video link, which is a first, isn't it? So we'll see how this one goes. But we must say first, Ian, your background, what a day that was. We'll, we'll get on to the grand final, of course. But, I mean, what a moment for Salford round the corner from, from Old Trafford with... Mr. Mike Flanagan, lying. If you, just, I mean, if you just moved slightly a few inches, you'll see Flanagan in the lineup there. What a day that was, Ian. He's there, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, thought, I thought I'd put it on for Flash just so. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Reminisce. Have a, look, have a look at himself again. Yeah, no, it was yeah. a good day that one, guys, and uh, proud to get there. But yeah, uh, great, uh, great attendance by the the Salford people, and although we couldn't pull it off to a great state side, it was an amazing night. It looks really weird, doesn't it? With no crowds. Do you know, looking behind yeah. Ian Blees now, again, for the people who are watching, just how many people we get jammed into Old Trafford for grand Amazing. final night. It feels like ages. It feels like 10 years ago, doesn't it? Seen that, you know, level of sort of support. So yeah. hopefully we'll get back there. Soon. A sign of things to come. Look, I mean, it's, it's fair to say, Ian, I think that you are Salford through and through, aren't you? You were born in, in Swinton. Um, you know, mm. what is it? Over 250 appearances for, for Salford at the, the Willows back in the day, mid 80s, all yeah. the way up to sort of late 90s. When you look back at those memories and, and those Willows days, what was that like for you? Oh, it was amazing as, as, a, as a young kid playing for Folly Lane Amateur Club and then signing for your home team or hometown club. It was uh, amazing to do it and I maybe debut pretty quickly uh, and sort of like set little goals throughout my career to to make the first team to play 10 games because I think I had the old contract where you played 10 games you got a bit of money you played 20 games you got a bit more money and then I ended up being captain Kevin Tamas at the time pulled me on training session said I want you to be skipper so that was another one of my objectives and goals and then to play so long for the team yeah and our testimonial there I was really proud to do it and we had a great chairman at the time John Wilkinson and the Willows was a was a great place to play at, you know. Uh, the shed there, you've got the old nightclub that used to be at the back end where we used to go probably sometimes on a Friday night after games. And great atmosphere, mate. And it was a shame to leave there. We went to the uh, AJ Bell at the time. And uh, yeah, probably difficult to recreate that atmosphere, but it was a great occasion to play there. And some memory memories there, really good. I mean, look, you were named captain, weren't you, in 1990? You twice lifted the, the, the divisional title with them. How how different were those days to the to the rugby? I mean, it probably seems a million miles away from what you see on a weekly basis now. Yeah, I, I watch the game now, and these lads have played in the modern era. It's uh, there's no way I could I could last in this game. Listen, I was just a, a, a kid who who enjoyed playing. I started late. I didn't start till I'd left school, and uh, I love football. Football mad, Manchester United mad. Still am to this day, really. Uh, but was lucky, fortunate, got scouted and, and, and played for me play for my hometown club, so that was really good. But this this modern game, there's not a chance I'd last in it, you know. And I, and I watch it and think, how did how did I do that game? It's just uh, the, the collision and the speed now is is fantastic. You know, it, it's a million miles away from from what we used to play. But every now and then we've got an old boys WhatsApp group and we share a couple of videos here and there. I think we played in a couple of Lancashire Cup finals, and as you say, we played at Old Trafford a couple of times. Uh, I was fortunate to play in the Lancashire uh, Yorkshire. War of the Roses as well, which is a really eye-opener for me at the time because I'm not going to be disgruntled our, our team at the time, but it wasn't the best team I was playing in, but I managed to play in a great Lancashire team with Sean Edwards, Bobby Goulding, Dennis Betts, Richie Ayres, Andy Platt, uh, Sean Wayne. And it was just great for me at that time to try and step up to that level. And it was a lot different. Uh, and it's a lot different now. The, the game is so quick, so fast. And um, I'm in awe at the times when I stand on the touchline and I like to get a feel of it watching early on in the game. I still to this day go, wow, this is, you know, this is amazing. This sport is absolutely amazing. Is it more entertaining now? Or there, there was elements of the game back then in that, that were very entertaining, weren't they? So I watched some of the footage back, you know, for the, the early 90s, you know, that uh, maybe late 80s, early 90s. And it was entertaining, wasn't it? You know, you speak about speed and intensity, but it was still entertainment. It was... Uh... Yeah, you like the loose forward, you know, traditional loose forward. And I, and I look back and think of like, I don't know, Les Holiday, Harry Pinner, you know, some real Steve Norton, some real great loose forwards there. Mark Flanagan, great ball handling, loose forwards. And, and uh, you know, really, you know, Andy Gregory, Scrum Half, Bobby Gould, and real characters as well, Sean Edwards. Great, Ellery Hanley, just amazing. Uh, so I was privileged to play in that era, even though it wasn't as quick and as, as fast probably. And, we, you know, we weren't all full time. I didn't go Super League till I think I was... 30 when we went Super League so I managed to I actually worked at the same time as being full time uh, I worked for the, the, the Salford Council at the time and they gave me time to to play and train and work as well so I was lucky uh, 
but there were some amazing characters in the game then Mark and and and, and John and and uh, as you know uh, a very entertaining game there was a lot of fisticuffs as well which probably yeah it was far it was far know. more violent back then wasn't it I, I, my dad <laughs> sits me down once a week and puts on his his old highlights from the eighties and I watched some of those those games and I think it was the two things that stri- strike most to me were far more vi- violent, a lot more fisticuffs, and secondly, it was a lot more unstructured. There was it was probably a lot more chaotic in terms of play. The ball speed was much quicker because there was no wrestle. There was like one man in the tackle. The defensive structures were kind of non-existent in some ways. So there, it was very, very different sport. I think similar to now, rugby league and rugby union are very different. Well, I think if you go back 20, 30 years. Rugby league now and rugby league then is is, is similarly, you know, contrasting. Um, and yeah, it was the violence that probably I probably wouldn't wouldn't have been able to keep up with. I think I'd be as fit, but just not as many fisticuffs to me. Has it been sanitised too much then, Ian? You're you're in you're in administrator now. You know, you're in you're in a different capacity. You know, you played through. You know, what was it? Not just a violent. It was a skillful era of the game, but a violent or more violence. Uh, a lot of that stuff. Were, you know. It's part of the DNA of our sport. Have we gone too far the other way? Yeah, I mean, we don't want to see, you know, could end up like the Wild Wild West again if we're not careful. And it wasn't far short of that at the times. You know, the referee used to let us get on with it. We'd have a good punch up probably the first 10 minutes of the game. And when we'd all calm down, he'd say something like, you know, actually play some rugby now. So I don't think we need to go back to them days. Uh, and I'm all for player welfare. I sit on the player welfare board at Super League and I'm all for that. Uh, but... Uh, the answer to the question is a difficult one because I do want to protect players and I'm, and I'm all about, you know, the head collisions and we, we, we've done some great stuff at Salford with the gum shields at the moment, testing impact and collision. Uh, but you can't be, you know, the shoulder charge is a great is a great topic probably that everybody's got a, an opinion on. Uh, and I do like it when it's confrontational and, and there's a lot of uh, aggression within the game. Uh, but I'm, I'm comfortable where it's at, but I don't think we can go any more or less than than having a real aggressive sport that, that, that what rugby league is all about, really. Ian, on the subject of violence, and tell me to, to fuck off if you don't want to talk about this, but I've read some quotes, for, you know, I, th- I think you're pretty comfortable. Um, uh, I'm quite interested about your altercation that you had with a, a touch judge. It was when you were playing for, for Solford, and it was towards the end of your, your career. And, you know, these were the olden days and the glory days and so on, weren't they? But you basically had a, had a, a fight with a touch judge, and, you, you know, you weren't in a no. great place at the time. Is this not true? No, it wasn't a fight. No, I, it, I actually, uh, I was playing for the reserves. It was just before the Australian uh, World Club Series. You remember when we used to go, and I'm thinking, oh, I've come back from injury. I might just get to Australia. Uh, Andy Gregor was coach at the time. And uh, I was playing reserve match coming back from to fitness and uh, I had a bit of an argument with the touch judge and the referee called me over and the touch judge, touch judge, touch judge came across and said, mm. uh, Ian's abused me, which was probably right. <laughs> and as he put me in the sim bin, I, I just walked past him and, and stood on his toe. Brush, brush past him. Is that all it was? And he did like the, yeah, he did like the pa- Paolo Di Canio one where he sort of like stumbled Paul backwards. Paul yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and to be fair, he, he, he went to the hearing and, and backed me up, said I've had Ian for, you know, refereed him, linesman him for, for many years, never never done anything against me. And they backed me up at the hearing, but obviously you can't do it, you can't get away with it. You got a lifetime ban at the time, Ian. I, I did it first, I did it first, mate, yeah, I did, that's, yeah. That's uh, mental. I mean, that's insane <laughs> given what you could get away with back then, a lifetime ban, which got reduced to what, 10 months? You, you yeah, said John got, Wilkinson, yeah. you're the, the son of John Wilkin. Uh, as you, you'd you like to assume. You know, he got you a good lawyer and you kind of got off in the end, didn't you? But then you, and then you joined Swinton. But that was kind of the end of your Salford career. Yeah, that, that was me done. I remember collecting my boots knowing that that was me done and it wasn't the right way to go out. But, you know, I had a good chat with the chairman and obviously brought, brought the club into disrepute, which wasn't good. So I had to take my punishment and then I ended up at Swinton after that. So, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't all people crack it up to be. Either. It was just a brush past the linesman and he made a bit of a meal of it, which he opened up to at the hearing. So... It was just uh, one of them things in life. It was, uh, yeah, you have to stop laughing and get on with it, don't you? That is not what I expected from rugby league in the the mid nineties. <laughs> I thought you'd, you'd be a lot more to be getting a lifetime ban. Um, look, before we get <laughs> onto the, the current job in modern day Salford, um, what do you, uh, what were you doing? You know, post rugby when you, when you eventually retired at, at Swinton, you were, you had a little dabble in player agency and in, in construction in housing. Yeah, I, I, I spent a bit of time in uh, asset management and construction since I left school, really. Uh, I was an apprentice joiner in construction and then worked my way through the management trail of, of construction asset management. Worked for the council for 17 years, ended up doing a master's and then went into uh, being a player's agent. I did that for about five or six years, hence why I met Marwan Kukash. Uh, we had a box at, at the AJ Bell 
uh, a business box at the AJ Bell and ended up going to know Mar- growing to know Marwan there. You know, looked after about 30, 30 odd players or something by the time I'd switched over to become How would CEO you at Salford. Marwan, Ian? Character, uh, definitely a character. Uh, and, and to be fair, you know, uh, as well documented, the club was on its backside when he came in and he was the only guy who stuck his hand up and, and to come in. So we were very fortunate to get him and his and his millions of pounds. At the time, I couldn't get anywhere near him. When he first happened, <clears throat> he had other people around him. So I wasn't, you know, going to join that club till five years on of his tenure, really. So he was, he was, uh, he was well into it. Then I think that he was at the end of his tether virtually when I when I took over, which was after the million pound game that we uh, <clears throat> that we won. And he said, if we win this game, I want you to come in, which I did. Obviously, Mark was playing in that in that famous million okay, pound game, and I'm sat there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sat there thinking, oh, I'm not getting my dream job here. We're not going to win this with, you know, whatever. Minutes to go and then Flash give that super patch out, didn't he, to, uh, to Greg Johnson, I think it was. And, uh, and Gaz, 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 Gaz dropped. Dropped. He got, he got Gaz the headlines dropped instead dropped of me. <laughs> yeah. I'm not bitter, <laughs> I'm not bitter, I'm not bitter at all. So, yeah, my one was a, was a, you know, indebted, giving me a dream job, to be fair. And he put a lot of money into the club and he, and he owns up to it now. He didn't, get, he, didn't, he didn't get it right at the start. He didn't put the foundations in. He went straight in at a high level trying to get, you know, High profile players who didn't play for him and the, didn't play for the badge. What so was well his expectancy though that, when he went in, like, you know, all guns blazing? Because did, did he have a kind of unrealistic view of where he could take them so early on, which never could be matched? I think so. I think, you know, by, buying some of the players that he bought was just mistake after mistake. Getting bad af- advice off Australian agents, sending players over that were never going to fight for this club. And that's what we want off our players. And, you know, we got, we've got that in later years. Uh, but yeah, he got bad advice early on. I think he admits that now, and, and he's, he's often said that if if he'd have had me and Watto in at the start, it'd probably been a different story for him. Yeah, I think I think that when I came in, I came in as Watto took over 2015, and I'd heard all the rumblings and the stories about players doing certain things and and not playing for the badge and taking money and taking cars or whatever. And I felt sorry for Marwan at first when I, when I heard the story. Mm. I thought a lot of people were taking the piss out of him. Um, but then I kind of I understood that yeah the advice he got on player recruitment was was all wrong and I think it was probably 2015 2016 2017 they built a bit of a bit of a foundation of of players that kind of bred good habits and 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 wanting to build something and play for the badge and I think you know they've had a tricky start this year but I think that investment in character and work ethic because kind of they've reached quite a bit of rewards on that it's always hard to play for a badge though when money is central to the decisions when you're getting players in so if if you've got huge financial resources and you want to tempt players away from other clubs you have to pay them a little bit more and I think sometimes Ian that's a real challenge isn't it you get somebody on big money and you've drawn him away from other club it's difficult then to really understand where he's passion will you can do both you can put you can play for money but also have pride in your performance and and treat a club with respect but I don't think they had that yeah, yeah no. I think you're right I think I think you're both right uh, you, know, you know players will come for the money that you throw at them won't they and, yeah, yeah. but I think if you look the way we've recruited them and, and Flash has mentioned that from like 16, 17, 18, 19 I think we did our due diligence really well on our players and we looked at their background their you know their families what their habits were like off the pitch um, and me and Watto went into pretty much and we still do to this day a lot of detail about that and if you don't do that I think you're taking a risk, and look, we took some risk, and, and I'm, you know, I mentioned Jackson Hastings. He was a massive risk for, for us in 19, 18, 19. But you know, it was a calculated risk, uh, and, he, and he come for the right money, uh, and he ended up being a great success for us. And I think Marwan tried that with a few players, and you know, I won't name them, but you know, it's well documented who they are. Uh, they got absolutely bags load of cash, but didn't want to play for this club. And the stories you heard, I heard them, and I was only behind the scenes at the time, but it, it was horrendous. But we managed to. Like Flash said, we, we bought Flash, Lee Moss, players like that, slowly over the years, we managed to turn that culture around. Mm. What is it then with, with owners, Ian? Because you see it in football a lot as well, when owners come in and great, if it's all in, a, in the right place of where he wanted to take the, the club and the vision that he had and ego, I'm sure, plays a big part, doesn't it? When when you look at the sort of background, I mean, Marwan's got about 150, 200 racehorses and, you know, he's, he's, he's got a history in, in, in sport, albeit not a, a team sport like that. But where was his his heart then at at the beginning? I just I struggled to put the picture together of where he thought he could take that club. I think I think he wanted a trophy straight away, didn't he? You know, and, and that's 
and these guys will know you can't build a build a sports club just on money alone you can't it's impossible you need your element i think my great belief is you need an element of of, of local people within your club who have that drive and ambition i hope to try and sell that to the club uh, when assigned players uh, and then you need that experience within your playing group you need that uh, camaraderie that team spirit and you've got to build and that doesn't happen overnight and you, you've got to have and we've not we still not cracked this at Salford. You've got to have a great underpinning of youth uh, and a good academy set up, which we haven't done. We haven't managed that, but we've managed to sort of like go middle of the road with it. But there's a lot of factors in a sports club. And I, and I came in and thought, this is probably a 10 year job. This a decade of hard work. I'm, I'm halfway through that. I've only been there for five years and we've, we've had some reasonable success, but not won anything as such. Uh, and, we, and we're, you know, teetering at the bottom this season, which is not good for my health either. So we've still got a lot of work to do on a daily basis, uh, but it doesn't happen overnight, I don't think. Unless, you know, I think football's a lot different. I think you can buy a bit of success in football. Rugby's about your teammate who's who's next to you in that line, who's got to cover your, your backside, who's got to make sure, you know, we, we do the work for one another. It's a bit different, I think, than football. Uh, so owners have got to be dead careful, I think, where they spend the money and how they spend the money. But was it Marwan coming in with such a big personality and at that time what the club needed? As in, obviously he brought the wealth, but then he, he, he actually, I thought, really got Salford onto making headlines and made big splashes, didn't he? You know, is, was, was that a positive of what he did? Probably at the start. And I think at the end of it, you know, and, and some of the stuff that went on annoyed him. And then he sort of like, not, I'm not saying he turned on the fans, but he didn't. He lost the fans over the years and he admits that and he lost the businesses. And when I walked through the door, it was an empty vessel. It was horrendous, the relationships that had broken down. Not just his fault, you know, previous administrators' faults as well. And it was pretty much an empty vessel, which was good, but it was just so much work in that first 12, 18 months. It was, uh, it was really demanding, but the players were good and they helped me a lot and... You know, some of the CD leaners like Mark and Lee Mossop, as I've mentioned, and Watto was good, but he was new. He was enthusiastic. He was great to work alongside. Uh, and we slowly, Martin Gleeson was, was you know, a, a cog in that wheel that turned slowly, slowly over the months, over the years. And it was difficult, but he was he was a character. You're dead right. He was a, and he brought something to the game that is probably missing, but he just needed to manage himself probably a bit better. The, the big question is, is, is Dr. Devil still around? Because that was... Um... Yeah. You know, and it was obviously modelled on Marwan quite closely, wasn't it? Is he still, is that moustache gone? Is he looking a bit different? The goat is gone. The goat is gone. The goat is gone, but we've got a new one this year. We've, we've, we've got a new uh, mascot who's, as soon as the crowds are allowed to come in, he'll make an appearance. So <laughs> oh, come what, on. What's you he called? Leave it at that. What's he called? We need a bit of a preview. Come on. <laughs> I, I, think, I think they've chosen the name, but Dr. I don't Please. think they've announced it because they do, <laughs> they're doing a raffle or naming competition. So, yeah. That's <laughs> a really dangerous game to play, though, isn't it? Because you, you, we, we spoke about this on the podcast where they had to name, was it an Arctic explore, exploration vessel? And they opened up to a public forum did, of, yeah. to name it and they named it Boaty McBoatface. <laughs> yeah, they did. <laughs> the best name ever. <laughs> it's going to be Marwan. No. They're going to call it Marwan. They are. They're sadistic, these rugby fans. That's yeah. Well, there's a lot of talk that that is him inside the costume. Yeah, there is a lot of talk, isn't there? Yeah. There is a lot of talk. Um, look, I know, uh, Ian, when you first, before we came on, I said to you, you know, what's your day been like? Did it a bit of small talk? And you went, oh, it's been fucking mental I mean what's, what's an average day in Ian Blees's life sort of mid-season because we had Chris Radinsky on uh, a few weeks ago mm. and yeah, I imagine like the that, sort yeah. of the checkbooks that Chris has got the section with the where you put all the zeros is a little bit bigger than what you've got to play with yeah uh, yeah but listen it, it, it's you know I know Chris well and, and Fitz here we, we, we chat quite a lot and we, we're obviously busy in different circumstances different clubs it's uh, it, it, it's a crazy job I love it listen I love it I wouldn't you know it's um, it's a real opportunity to work in in sport number one the club I love and adore number two uh, and I, I would never I wouldn't change it well, I've had an absolute shocker today I, I, I can't say much about it but it, you know it's been an absolute shocker but it started at I think quarter to seven uh, it's not Flanagan's severance not, package. No, it's nothing to do with yeah. that. No, that was a little. But yeah, it's about you know controlling the recruitment at this time of year. It's recruitment time, uh, but it's difficult. Uh, and I've said in the past, over the past couple of years, it's been quite good. I wouldn't say easy. It's never easy recruiting the right players, as we've just talked about. You've got to do your due diligence and make sure it's right for the club and the, and the, and the team. Uh, I've got the window cleaner cleaning the windows here, by the way. Sorry <laughs> if you can hear it. Uh, and, and when does it's that start that, though, in that process? You mentioned recruitment. You know, for you, obviously, where we are recording this now, we're kind of you know the, yeah. end, the end of June. But when when do you start? Has it already started? When does it really heighten? I never stop. I, ne I never stop looking. To be fair, and, and noting and watching. Uh, but it starts officially April May, and we got we'll go right through. Now we've been quite. 
uh, inactive at this moment in time because we want it to be right. And, and honestly, when when you when you're where we are in the league, it's difficult. Uh, um, but when we had success in nineteen and twenty, the agents were coming to me. Your phone, your phone stops ringing a little bit when you when you are where you are. But I understand that. I think I think in seventeen after the million pound game, it was really tough to recruit because they still weren't convinced that we were going to do it well the year after. And we did languish a little bit until we did some good signings. So it's difficult. It starts about yeah April and works right through. So I'll still be at it October, uh, November probably. Yeah, I mean, look, going going back on, on the subject of recruitment, lots to talk to you about, but. Salford have had a high turnover of players, haven't they? You know, particularly in the time that you've been there in the, the Kukash days. Um, because you were always going to have the vultures flying around. You know, they came and picked Jackson Hastings. That No one went for Mark, but they picked a few other players and, you know, the Murdoch <laughs> Masillas. And, you it's know. funny today, isn't it? But, but yeah. what, what is that? Saying those all about rugby league. What is that like uh, with, with that, that turnover and, and having uh, to keep those vultures away? Because sometimes you, you want them to come and to pay you big money to take someone. Yeah, and, we, and you know, when I look back at the... the the, the transfers we've done, and I remember sat in the sat in the office, and we saw Benny Murdoch. My one said he's going, and I think that was my one was probably on his way out then. And I, and I sat in the office signing the transfer. I think it was about half seven at night. I'm thinking, this is not me. I don't want to do this. But I, you just wake up in the morning and think it's done. You've got to get on with it. You've got a group of players with families. You've got the the back office staff relying on you to do the right job. Uh, you know, over the time we've sold quite a lot. You know, Ben Murdoch, who you mentioned, Gaz O'Brien. Junior Sal left us. We've made some crucial uh, Rob decisions. Louis. Rob Louie, you know, that was a, a pretty good deal on our behalf when, when Tui came across. How uh, hard is it, though, to we, make progress, Ian, when all that's happening? Because some of it's planned and structured, yeah. and some of it, you know, you didn't yeah. think it was coming. No, some of them, Ben Murdoch and Gaz O'Brien, were with like 24 hours' notice. They're on the way, and that was it. Uh, one player said, I'm not going to go and change his mind within 12 hours. So it's it just, yeah, it's not easy, mate. Uh, and I, I've said it before, you, you grow to get, you get used to it a little bit that I have a turnover of probably 10 players, but looking at our squad, that's naturally going to happen when you're only going to give him two year contracts out, three years tops. And I don't like to give too long contracts out because I think this complacency can set in a little bit and I don't want that either. So it's a real tough balance. But as Mark knows, as, as, as players, as ex-players, you just, you, 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 you become hardened to things, don't you? And you just get on with life and your job in hand and it's just the character of a rugby league player and, and Salford in general is a hard working city and it takes its knocks and it comes back and it's resilient and I try and be a bit like that but secretly sometimes I'm coming home and Sal and my wife's like are you okay and I'm like yeah probably not okay but I just crack on and get up in the say, morning do you and, say and like that <laughs> yeah no probably not okay but we'll just brush yeah. over that one tea, love. I do yeah what's for tea yeah and get me yeah. a beard out of the fridge yeah, that's yeah. that attitude yeah. but, like, but I imagine your, your past your history History, uh, you know, even though it was semi short lived as a, as a player agent, it's, it puts you in good stead, doesn't it, Ian, to, to deal with what you have to deal with on that basis? Yeah, and again, talking about relationships with, that were happening on the, in the club when I walked through the door, the, 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 the relationship with the agents was absolutely probably rock bottom, especially in Australia because of everything with, that had gone on in the past few years. So, And that took a while to build that. That, that didn't overnight. I mean, what I worked on that really well, I thought. And we've got some good relationships and, good, and some good players off the back of working hard on that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, you've got to get the right player for Salford, that's for sure. We took some risks. We took some players who were probably... You know, cast aside, shall we say? And I think I think Phil Clark said one. It's a team of castoffs, you know, which we took great pleasure in in, in relying on for motivation. But you, know? you galvanised uh, them together, and that's what that's what you did under Watto, isn't it, Mark? When you were there, you know, yeah, we you, were mean, you could argue you were cast away to a certain degree. Yeah, you? I was. Yeah, we were probably a lot of players want want to play for Saints, Wigan, Warrington, and, and be regularly competing for trophies. But I think we all found ourselves in a situation where we were playing for Salford, but. I think the common theme between each play was we were competitive and had pride in the jersey and no matter how talented we were, we kind of we were really resilient and, and hard to beat. And that's and that's what drove to that success that year. I think Saints were always a better side than us and played better than us in that final. But, you know, we were rarely um we rarely lost ourselves. We were always beaten by a better side. And I think uh, that was one thing that probably Watto brought brought the best out in us as well. I think you're right, mate. And I think, you know, going to them 2019 games, going to Hull away, 
you know, as an administrator thinking, you know, we're going to go there and win tonight. It was great. For, you know, it, my job was easy because I just signed a few players along the way. And, and these guys were just tremendous because to do what they did that year was nothing short of a miracle getting to a grand final. It wasn't when you look back on, you know, the lowest operating playing budget, etc. Uh, and these guys just toughed it out week in, week out and turned up for one another. It was great to watch. It was amazing. And when you look at how you, you guys, Mark, built up to 2019 and obviously, you know, Challenge Cup final, grand final and you know post sort of million pound game I guess that was a bit of a catalyst into that that I remember a time when you when did you sign 15 16 something like that start of 15 yeah. I remember there were times where you, you know you were going around to clap the players at the end of a game and we know there's expectancy from Salford um, fans as I'm sure Ian remembers from the Willows days that, that there's something about that club where they expect to be you know higher than where they are right now as we're recording this but they were you know and I know and I know fans always will give you shit but there was a time where they were saying all sorts of things to, to the players and it's been a, a from a journey from that stage to the picture in Ian's background at Old Trafford where it was absolutely packed out with, with Salford fans who from, from Willows and post days. Yeah, I think all clubs, all teams have certain uh, highs and lows during the season and I think we've got a particularly passionate fan base even though it's not as it's not as large as, as some clubs but I think they're probably more passionate which which has pros and cons and I think when you're losing they might be a bit more vocal than, than some but other teams. But it's only the most passionate fans but who tough it out, isn't it? That's true, so yeah. You, so yeah. what you get, it's like natural selection. You, 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 the fair weather fans get sort of wheedled out. If you've had a tough period, I think St. Helens in the in the 80s struggled for a period of time and, you know, that probably wheedles out, you know, a lot of the fair weather fan, fans. Then you're what you're left with is a really, like, vociferous, passionate bunch yeah. that's actually a real strength for your club, but it's also then yeah. when things aren't going well, they're the first people yeah, and to I'm, tell you. Yeah, I'm thick-skinned enough to know that... <laughs> It's only a game. I didn't play as well as I could have done, and it just you well, just move on to the next week. There were all sorts of people, yeah, yeah, there, there is. Time. But you know, they were all turned out for us in the, in when we went to Wigan away in, in the semi final to get to to, um, to Old Trafford. So, like you know, we spoke to Sam Tompkins. You've just got to be quite thick skinned and not take it too 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 seriously, really. How how disappointing was it, Ian? Then after that that grand final that's behind you, to then fall into lockdown restrictions, COVID. You know, you must have been rubbing your hands together, thinking right commercially now. Let me have a go at it. Let me have a go at this. And then to not be able to do that. It's like the Challenge Cup, you know. We had, we had a couple of weeks to prepare for a final that you normally get a couple of months and, and cash in on shirts and merchandise and ticketing. It was just... And we, then we play at Wembley without any crowd for the first time in 50 years. It was like, this could only happen to Salford, you know. Uh, <laughs> so it, it, it was such a bizarre occasion. I remember when we walked out on the pitch, I could hear my own heart beating. It was that quiet at Wembley. You, you just couldn't write the script. And yeah, commercially, it's been, it's been a shock about it. And we're not... I read an article last week, Adam Pearson wrote in the whole... Uh, press and it was absolutely bang on it's been a shocking time for clubs not just you know uh, us as rugby the sport in general but look we've had a you know we've had a pandemic where we've lost loads of lives so you know does sport really you know can it complain too much but commercially it's not been the best time to get to two finals that's for sure with you know with that packed out Old Trafford you know is it recuperable in terms of the idea was that win or lose at Old Trafford that you would be then selling all sorts of more season tickets. Look, come down, only a couple hundred quid, not even that, to, to watch your club at home every home game. Is, is that still salvageable with post-COVID days? No, it's tough, mate. It really is. Uh, we, you're probably right. We've, we've missed some sort of boat. We need to get on the next boat that's sailing out of the town, probably. It's, it's going to be really difficult, uh, but we've got to get success on that pitch again. And that's what brings punters and sponsors through the door. So we've got to keep doing that. Uh, we've obviously rebuilt in the backroom team in the off-season with Ian Watson leaving us. So... We've still got a load of work to do on the pitch and off the pitch, mate. And going back to the, the, the COVID situation and how hard most clubs have been hit, I remember the first Zoom call we had that, that most players had where they were having pay cuts and everything. I remember, I think it was you or Paul King saying, in some ways, with Salford being a small club and not having the overheads of the Wiggins, the Leeds, where they've got ground staff to pay, big, big costs every month. Have, how, how are we doing on the back of, you know, being a bit bit smaller, being more flexible, not having those overheads. Will that stand us in better stead going forward compared to other clubs? Yeah, and, and we did say that at the time. You're right. Uh, and and it, small small was good, I think, at the very start of it. Uh, but no matter what it is, you've still got to pay your bills. You've still got to pay the players. They've all got family support. We didn't. We don't own their ground, which, is, again, was a big positive when you listen to St. Helens and other clubs, Wigan, uh, I think they rent anyway. But there's some other clubs who own the grounds where you think, wow, all the ground staff there. So we've come out of the back of it. We've, we've took, you know, we've took government loans, some government assistance in that, like 
most of the clubs have done, I think. Uh, we've had to do that because we haven't got a benefactor anymore. You've got Paul King running it with the board there. So uh, it's not it's not the most healthiest position we've been in. But when Marwan left, left, he, left he wrote his, uh, I think he said, £5 million of, of director's loan off. So we debt free as a club, uh, which was amazing. For probably the first time in our history. We wrote our CBA off, which was great work by the board, and we took a points deduction for that, but that was a smart bit of business. Uh, so we've been pretty well looked after in the background as a club. Um, we just need to keep pushing and pushing and making sure the results on the pitch resonate with the sponsors and the fans, I guess. There was a point at which I thought of you directly, Ian, and I was driving out of Manchester on, on the dual carriageway coming out of Manchester. It was the middle of lockdown. I'd just been into the bakery, our bakery in town, and it was like maybe six o'clock in the morning or something like that. And there's a giant digital display board. Mm. And mm. this is where it dawned on me. You know, obviously I was selfishly, you know, you think about your own business and we'd, we'd going through a tough period. And then yeah. I thought to you and Salford, because, you know, I, in the past I've spoken of the challenges for Salford and the smaller clubs without doubt, you know, I've, I've had an opinion on that. But as I was driving out of Manchester, I saw the board of the sort of grand final and the hype behind Salford and it dawned on me how important that was and mm. that actually how, you know, desperately unlucky it was that you wouldn't get the opportunity to really sort of cash in on that. You know, and it was just this moment. It's like po mm. post-apocalyptic scene. Nobody's in Manchester. I was driving out of the city. <laughs> There's nobody there. And then the Salford Red Devils, you know, shot up on the LNX display board or whatever it was. And I, yeah. You know, I thought yeah. I thought about you all at that stage because you'd, you'd done a lot of hard work and then to not be able to capitalise on it is tough. But like you said, yeah. how, how do you get on that next boat then, Ian? How do you as, get... As a, yeah. as, as a community club, mate, I think, I think you know, we, we're still trying to get that message across to, to the spectators. You need to come and support us and, and walk up and I know it's hard earn your money and, and, and the only way we survive is by, you know, commercialising the, the, the club even more now over the next 12 months months two years take it one year at a time really uh but the, the the city of salford have got to back us as well uh with the stadium uh with the with the with the ground sharing etc we've, we've got to be looked after uh we bring a lot to the community we do and if you have a look at you know we talk a lot about mental health of people we do, we do a lot within the city with our foundation if you have a look at the work that they do it's tremendous out there so we do bring a lot of joy to people yeah you're right we could do with some more numbers through the through the turnstiles, uh, and that's something we've got to keep working. We could never drop that baton. I think I think I think the next bus is, is top six for us. We've got to get in that top six. We've got to compete regular. We've set we've set the bar now. And I think somebody else asked me, you know, the the anticipation, the expectation, and I love that. I don't mind that. I think that's great for for our fans to have that now. I, th I think we should thrive in that and, and really work towards their expectations because we've been to two finals now. We need to go and win one now, but that's not easy at the moment. That's tough because we've had to do a full rebuild as we've already talked about again. And that'll happen again at the end of this season. So it's not easy, mate, but we've just got to keep at it. And what's the situation with the stadium? Because we see a lot in the press about it being sold off to Sale or Salford City Football. What What's the situation with the Red Devils on it? I think I think the the, the council are, are gonna liaise with us soon about what our options will be. So we'll have to wait for that time uh, and, and negotiate with them on what what the potential options would be. Mark, it's gonna be it's gonna be a tough time for the club. I've no doubt. We never do things easy in Salford. Uh, it's, it, it won't be easy to negotiate these types of things because this is a this is a big operation we're talking about here. But I'm sure there'll be some options that we have to choose as a club. And um, we'll see when they come out at the right time what, what, what our fans want to do mostly because it is a community club and our board. Uh, and we'll take it from there, mate. But it's not going to be, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a, yeah, an interesting time. It's, it's, I guess it's difficult. And I think of the comparison of Sale Sharks, who obviously, you know, shared that stadium with for quite a few years, having mm. been to, you know, um, you know, Edgeley Park in Stockport, having actually been sort of ripped out of the heart of Sale initially, and then playing somewhere near Eccles, where, where none of their fans are from. It's it's difficult because you, you that geography is so important, isn't it to you? Mm, it is, and, and you know we've still got the stadium there with a lot of land around it. And you know if you if you think about the Willows, we didn't have any space around there. We couldn't even build a, a big enough car park for match day, but we've got the space, and I just hope there's a vision there 
with the powers that be because it could be a sporting club of Salford. It was built for the community and I hope they remember that. And uh, it's very important to me that the city has somewhere to focus on, not just for a rugby team, but you've got, you know, Salford City FC doing pretty well now in the football. And there's, and there's games like, you know, indoor uh, netball. You know, just get the cl- class of 92, got plenty of cash. Come on, just get Gigsy, Skulls, yeah. just sign some checks. You'll have, you'll have Radinsky's uh, uh, size checks before you know uh, it. I think he's lost my number, that gigs here, but uh, yeah, I'm try- we're, tr- we're trying in the background, mate, that's for sure. We, we, we never stop trying at the club uh, and, and there'll be various options that we discuss at the right time with the right individuals, hopefully. How, how difficult was it, Ian, as well, to, to lose your good pal, Ian Watson, obviously went off to, to Huddersfield. I think you, you were neighbours for two decades, weren't you, in Worsley? I mean, you know, you obviously played together and had all sorts of... I still uh, see him out the window. Yeah, oh, yeah. is he gone? Is he dead? Not on the Christmas card list, is it? <laughs> no, we still speak. We were speaking last week. Uh, listen, yeah, as, as I told him, you know, he did fabulous things for the club. Flash will tell you that. He, he, was, he, was, uh, he was great for our club. He brought some great players in. He worked really well with them. He was an amazing guy at the time and he, and he got his success on the back of, of, of us working hard together and that's the players as well. Uh, they performed for him, he was respected, I still respect him. Uh, I just think probably could have left in a, in a better fashion. I think he probably regrets that a little bit now and, and probably we said things that we might sh- shouldn't have said maybe. So listen, we, we move on, it's rugby, we're, we're, it's a small game, we're all... We're all mates at the end of the day and uh, good luck to him. I hope, I hope he has but, some success in life. Yeah, yeah. the relationship you built, obviously, you know, well well past the days of playing together it was so impressive because essentially between a combination of all of you and the players, you turned that club from perennial relegation favourites into, you know, grand finalists and Challenge Cup finalists. Yeah, I think that was the players that, that you know, that, that the players, as I've already said, was tremendous that year. Absolutely fantastic. That, that great group. And I, I think I said that along the way and, and what all led that group and, and you know Paul Rowley came in and did well and Martin Gleeson left him, but he did really well building that up so there was lots of people within that club who, who did their did their own little bits to, to form that success and we just need to make sure as a club that that continues and that's my job to make sure it happens and The perpetual sort of challenge for, for Salford and for clubs um, you know whatever competition you're in whether it's football or rugby is that you provide a home for somebody that then they maybe improve the skill set to then move on. And like that's constantly a battle. So you develop a coach, Ian Watson cuts his teeth uh, three or four years, develops his reputation, then has, you know, leaves. And, and, and that ultimately is the biggest challenge, how you stop that cycle. Because ultimately the cycle, when it's working, would be Ian Watson has no other choice but to stay because, it, yeah. you know, yeah, success is guaranteed or whatever. Yeah. And, and, and but they're struggling but, as well, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, but that. But what I'm saying is that that when your director of rugby like Ian is, that's the environment now, and it, it needs to get to a point where people choose to stay and don't really think about leaving. Because that's where I came from, Ian, from Saints, mm. where you wouldn't. The only time you left is when you got told you're going, you're not good enough. Really, there was not a lot. Your of, legs have gone, John. Your legs, are, you're too slow, John. You give away too many penalties. You're leaving. No, Kicking game. That's, yeah, but that—that's <laughs> the situation you'd like to get to, in, I suppose. Where, yeah, you it know, is, people mate. Are just... uh, and, and you could ask yourself, why? Why didn't you leave Saints? And I've, the answer is because they're a great club, isn't it? And you've got a chance yeah. of winning things, John. That, yeah, that, yeah, that, absolutely. That, that's the reason, isn't it? It was a fabulous yeah, place yeah. to be around. It was a whole town of people wanting you to do well. You had a great backer there. You've got a great club, and yeah, that's what we're striving to do. But that, and as I've said already, it doesn't happen overnight. That does it. It takes a while to build it, and I think it it, it does come by winning something. But that's a million miles away at the moment. Is, but is, is a backer what you guys need now? Do you need somebody with cash to come in? It'd be great, but I, I, why wouldn't they have come already? You know, on the back of what yeah. we've done in the community and, and two finals, it's not easy to get any backers yeah. in sport. They, they, they favour football, not rugby league, unfortunately. Uh, but there's enough, I think, rich businessmen in Salford for them to for them to come to the fore. And we, and like I say, we're in a really healthy place. You know, as a club, as a sports club, we're in a really good place, and we're doing a lot. And there's success on a, on a shoestring at the moment, isn't there? So yeah. if we could just get a little bit of something. I'm sure we could really build that. I'd, I'd love to be able to have Marwan's money again or somebody yeah. else's money again. I, I sell all the horses, sell, sell the racehorses and go again. Have Marwan's money again. again. <laughs> it's it's 10 million, it's 10 million. <laughs> as far as I'll tell you, I'm tight and cramp and we had many discussions about his next contract and uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be frivolous. So I'd, I'd, 
I do it the right way. But well, I, I remember, I'll tell you what, Ian, that's just, that's just brought back a memory because I remember coming to watch Mark uh, and I was in the box with his dad and he was saying yeah. how he'd got um, this three-year deal and he signed this three-year contract. <laughs> and in the programme, it said a two-year deal and he was like, you could see him start to start scratching his nervous twitch. Will. He was a type It was a three-year deal. <laughs> did you have, did, well, you did have that three-year deal after yeah, all, Yeah, he was a type all, I told you the fucking look, we, time. We, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you did, like in front of your old boss. Um, look, Ian, before we let you go, I know you've mentioned COVID as well, but your... Um, the, the protocol with COVID, and I'm just thinking topical with all these games being called off left, right and centre. Mm. How mental is it within Super League? Because it, within the Premier League, there's such a big in financial infrastructure there to have all the testing and everything. Whereas it seems, and you know, I'm, I'm choosing my words caref carefully, but it does seem farcical within other sports. You haven't got the cash to implement it properly. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult period for the game, isn't it? And it's not a good look. Let's have it right. It's not a good look. And I'm not blaming anybody here. And I've said it previously, RFL have done a tremendous job. Absolutely superb what they've done since it started. And I've gone on record many times saying that. But it's getting to a stage. It's, I don't know. At some stage, we're going to have to learn to live with it a little bit, uh, I, I guess. Certainly the games that are getting cancelled now uh, are mind-boggling, aren't they, what's going on? Uh, and, you know, I, I'm sure there's going to be more issues coming in the next few weeks that we're going to have to handle as a game and I just hope that you know top six promotion relegations not on the back of you know percentage points decisions or, or games that are awarded on the back of teams not being able to raise a team because it doesn't feel right to be that as a game it really doesn't uh, but there'll be people above me making them decisions but I just and I said it at the very start of this season you know and we all thought probably by this time you know when we were doing the fixtures uh, Christmas time that we'd be probably on the back end of it we probably are coming towards the end but we're still, we're still living with it aren't we we've still got it uh, in and around the clubs uh, and I just hope that games titles promotion relegation is not decided on the back of some of the decisions we've got to make on the, on the back of a protocol that's brought in for the right reasons at the start of the year how long will it take the game to recover, Ian? This has took a chunk out the sport and, and look, business and, and all sports, hasn't it? But how long do you think the recovery sort of roadmap looks like for the game? I, I, I think many years, mate, and uh, I could be well retired by the time we properly recover, <laughs> I guess. You, you've got a few more uh, years at it than me. But uh, no, it's a, it's a long road, John, isn't it? You, you can yeah. feel it, you're a businessman, you know that. It's, mm. it's, it's going to be around for a long time and we're going to be paying for it for a long time, aren't we, as, as taxpayers, I think. It's not... It's not easily sold. And, and I hope, and I, I was looking around at our ground on, on uh, Sunday thinking, uh, I hope people haven't fallen out of the habit of coming to live sporting events. They were all desperate. They all felt desperate, I think, to come. But it's dead easy, isn't it, in this day and age to stay at home and to do whatever you're doing within the house, or Xbox or whatever the kids play on. I just hope we haven't lost that appetite for live sport. I really do. Well, look, we've kept you long enough, Ian, but look, I genuinely hope you sell those season tickets and find your boat and, and sail off into some sort of <laughs> sunset eventually. Look, I mentioned all this, I mean, Beckham spent long enough in Salford to splash in the ocean, just, you know, shamelessly write to David Beckham. and say, look, you've just, might be listening to this. You've did, well, never mate, you never know. He's, he's invested in, you know, into Miami. We just need, what do you need? A yeah, few, yeah. few mil, what are we talking here? Ian, what, Yo, no, not that much, not that much. I can, make, that I can much. make money. I can make money do wonders, don't worry about Wilkins that. Wilkins got yeah. that in his, in his garage in <laughs> Cheshire. <laughs> <laughs> half a mil Ian what, how much do you need that'll mil. do that'll get me yeah. three years that'll yeah, get me three yeah. years of, of, of the sort, that flash can sort it <laughs> but in all seriousness Ian just finally it, it is not a, a gross vast amount of money I know everyone's been hit even you know the richer have been hit and whatever and the, the richest are the tightest ones aren't they apparently so mm. it, but it but it is it, there, it is salvage well, I know you say you may have missed it because why would they not have come in in 2019 but as mm. these green shoots start to come through post-Covid hopefully there is something sprouting through for you Keep the faith, mate. Always keep the faith. Yeah. As a Salford fan, as an ex-player, you've always got to keep the faith at Salford. Yeah. Top man, Ian. Thank you so much, mate. Uh, best of luck thanks, with everything. Guys. Have a great season. Cheers, That's uh, Ian Blees, Director of Rugby and Operations at Salford. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody, to Out of Your League. You can download wherever you get your podcasts. You can watch us on YouTube and we will be back next week with another episode, Mark. I can't yeah, wait to see you and wait. you, John. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.